If you guys will open up your Bibles or follow along on the screen, this morning's sermon text is from Colossians 2, 6 through 15. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him the, full, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him and baptized, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were de dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. With its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for this time now that we have to open it and hear from you. Lord, would you teach us? Would you instruct us? Lord, would you help us to be a people who respond with gratitude and praise for all that you are and all that you've done, we pray. So, Lord, teach us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we come to week three in our series on liturgy. Uh, liturgy, simply put, that word, uh, refers to the pattern or structure of a worship service. As we go through a service together of worship, this is not some just randomly selected bunch of songs that we just happen to like and thought, oh, that would be neat, uh, but rather we are seeking to allow this service to be a gospel-shaped service. And that's our aim here at Redeeming Grace, and when we gather for worship, that the gospel itself would shape and direct and structure this gathering that we have today. Each week we attempt, to, we attempt to follow a very basic gospel-shaped pattern that has really shaped churches for hundreds of years, stretching all the way back to the Reformation. Uh, and we know that that continues to be this day. Just as a review, uh, you can see there the chart I think is still available for us as we've been walking through this, this series. Uh, and you could see that gospel-shaped pattern there under the gospel theme that God is holy, that we are sinners, that Jesus saves sinners, and then he, he continues that work of renewal as he grows and instructs us and then sends us back out into the world. We've talked about in our liturgy how we follow that basic gospel pattern as we go through a time of adoration and praise as we acknowledge the supremacy of God and the holiness of God and the majesty of God and that we give Him glory that is due His name. But as we celebrate some aspect of God's character, His nature, we are immediately reminded of who we are. And so then we enter a time of confession, sometimes through a prayer or a song, where we acknowledge our shortcomings and we acknowledge our sin before God, and then that is followed by some statement of assurance reminding us of the hope that we have as sinners in the finished work of Christ. And having been assured of that provision that we have in the gospel, we then respond with what we say, what we call thanksgiving. And we enter that part of the service that we just came out of before this uh, sermon, where we acknowledge through song, through prayer, uh, through giving, uh, just our gratitude for the goodness of God in our lives. And so that's where we want to pick up today as we, having considered already this aspect of adoration, and last week the aspect of confession, we now turn to that next part of the liturgy, that of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving really is a 
foundational matter for the Christian. It's a gospel reflex, as some people like to, to refer to it, that we should all have as we are confronted with the realities and claims of the gospel week after week. I, I read this morning from Psalm 100 as we began our time together, and it's a psalm that, that acknowledges uh, thanksgiving as a response to who God is. It's saying there in Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It's He who made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. And then it commands us there in verse 4, enter His his gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise. Paul says it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, that we are to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So it's in the context here this morning of our gathered worship that we continue to think on this aspect of thanksgiving, which is a reflex to the truths and claims of the gospel as we know how they are applied to our lives. And it's in the context of this gathered worship service today and week after week after week that, that we want to celebrate and acknowledge the work and beauty of Christ that we would respond in gratitude with thanksgiving. You know, it's, I, I've thought about this before. If, if you can leave here today or any week and come and gather and worship and sing, and you, if you can leave here and not be encouraged to thank the Lord in some way, then we have failed you in some way. If you can leave here and say, I just really don't have anything, that, that, that was nothing there for me to, to latch on to and to be thankful for, then we've not led you well. And so we want to make sure that we're creating an environment and, and having deliberate space, even in the service that we have together today, where you are encouraged in the truths of who God is and that you are encouraged in the work that God has done for you and for me in the work of Jesus that would foster a gratitude and a thanksgiving. And in order to do that, we want to keep a regular focus on the work of Christ. We want this service to be Christ-centered and and gospel-focused in the ways that that He continues to, to encourage us in all that He's done for us. Here in Colossians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, we see how Paul's reflection upon the centrality of Christ in this letter and, and as he just reflects upon the redemptive work of Jesus, how that's vital in cultivating a faithful and a thankful people. As we consider Paul's instruction here in this letter, I want you to see several related themes to thanksgiving, and, and I want you to see how Paul, as he reflects upon the gospel and how, how the claims that we find here really should fuel and inform our thanksgiving. You know, as Paul's in, in instruction, we, we, we see that he's writing to a church, a church that had endured a lot of uh, struggle, especially in relationship to false teachers in the world and, and, and during that day. And he's writing to, to center their perspective on the, the work and the, the beauty and magnitude of the gospel and how that impacted their lives as a whole. And that's really what we want to do each and every week here. We want to remind ourselves and center our lives and our perspectives upon the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we are reminded and renewed week after week after week of what Christ has done for us that we might walk in faithfulness with Him. As we think about this aspect of thanksgiving in the context of gathered worship, corporate worship, I want us to to consider several things this morning. We're in a series on liturgy, and so we're thinking about how this applies in a specific context, this gathering, week after week. But I think these things certainly would be applicable in all of our lives throughout the week as we seek to walk in faithfulness with Christ. Three things that I want us to consider in light of Thanksgiving this morning. I want you to see, number one, the call to Thanksgiving. Then we're going to consider the fuel of Thanksgiving, which will be most of the time together, and then at the end, the response of thanksgiving. So those are the three places. If you fall asleep and get lost along the way, that's the roadmap that will get you back on track very quickly as we consider these things, the call, the fuel, and the response. Let's consider, first of all, this morning, the call to thanksgiving. Paul's letter here to the Colossians is one that encourages thanksgiving really at every corner. 
you can see, you can see Paul, Paul's just really pointing the church to be thankful. You see it in really all chapters of this letter. Look at chapter 1. Paul's writing and he's introducing himself. He's, he's there in the introduction and he says in verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. You see it here in, in, chapter, in chapter 2. He's saying it multiple times here in chapter 2 in the text that was read just a moment ago. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Not just thankful, but abounding, overflowing with thanksgiving. You see it in chapter 3. Look at verses 14 and following. He says, and above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How? With thanksgiving in your hearts to God. So there, even in the context of corporate worship, Paul's saying that there ought to be this aspect of gratitude and thanksgiving present as we sing together and celebrate all that God is. You notice it again in chapter 4 where he says in verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And so, Thanksgiving really ought to be one of those dominating characteristics of the Christian life. We ought to walk out of a sense of gratitude each and every day. And so when we come in this gathering for worship, we want to be deliberate in how we point each other to be grateful. We want this service to be a call in some aspects, a call to gratitude, a call to thanksgiving. You see that here as Paul commands even the church to be thankful. There's this biblical expectation and calling for God's people to be grateful for what they have in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, in our worship, we want to encourage that as well. We want to be reminded that we have much to be thankful for. Again, if you, if you can be engaged in this worship service and leave here un, not grateful then something has either gone wrong in you or something has gone wrong in the structure of this service. Now, when you think about the call to thanksgiving, it doesn't mean, right, some of us are, are maybe sometimes overly rigid in how we think about things, and so uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to get up and say, okay, we've just had our time of confession. Now, you need to be thankful. You know, I mean, that's how we are as parents sometimes. You need to be thankful. You know, it's like almost force our ourselves or others into gratitude. That's not what we're trying to do. We may say, hey, we may refer to Thanksgiving, but we want to really cultivate cultivate a space here where Thanksgiving is, is, is a kind of a natural overflow or outflow of the heart as we're singing and celebrating and praying, hearing Scripture, that we just in our own hearts are thankful. And so, in that way, we want this service to call us to Thanksgiving not because somebody stands here and says, you should be thankful, but rather we're pointing to the one that grounds us with hope, and because of that, we respond with thanksgiving. We want to select songs and pray prayers and hear testimonies that foster that reflex of gratitude. Rehearsing this week after week after week in our times together is, is significant and formative. And that's how we want to hold out this call to gratitude. But how we do that matters. Again, we're not going to stand here and force you to be thankful and demand that you be thankful. We may command it from time to time based upon the context of what we're talking about it. Uh, but, but how we do that does matter. True thanksgiving must be fueled by the right object and truth that then generates gratitude, which leads me to the second point, the fuel of thanksgiving. 
the fuel of thanksgiving, as we're navigating that liturgy, as we've uh, spent time in adoration and praise, as we've confessed and been assured of our standing, confessed our sins and assured of our standing before God, then we then enter into this time of gratitude and thanksgiving. But what fuels that? What, what fuels it? Again, Paul in this letter is writing to Christians who are being influenced by, by worldly teaching, by false teachers. And as such, he wants to encourage the church to stay oriented towards Christ, not to lose sight of Jesus. And notice his strategy here. As you read, if you were to read the entire letter, and you could do that pretty easily uh, in four brief chapters, but, but look here, as, as Paul writes, he's He's writing there, and and he says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So he's commanding them to walk in Christ, being rooted and grounded in Jesus with thanksgiving. And then he says in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So he's He holds out there this this call to not be influenced, not be taken captive by worldly philosophy, by, by false teaching. But then notice what he does and doesn't do. He doesn't then go and unpack the tenets of the false teaching, does he? He could do that. He could point out and, and, and a, in a way to, to, that could be helpful just to say, show the shortcomings of where these false teachers go wrong, but he doesn't. And rather, he says, be warned of the false teachers, don't be taken captive by them, and then he quickly goes back to the work of Christ. And he, he unpacks all that Jesus has done, and he reorients them to thinking about Christ. You know, if these believers are going to stay the course with Jesus. They need to be encouraged in Him. And that's exactly what we're aiming to do in a gospel-shaped liturgy. We want to orient your hearts and your minds towards the glory and beauty and provision of Christ. Week after week when we gather, we want to be confronted with the amazing redemptive work of Jesus. And and if you ever get to a point in your life where we're like, "Can can we go can we just get past the gospel? That's like for lost people. And I'm not sure you're going to fare very well in this world. We desperately need to, to be grounded in, to be reminded of, to be able to, to reflect upon all that God has done for us in Christ, because that's why you and I live. That's why we have hope. It is the very source of our life and salvation. And so week after week, we want to see that. We want to celebrate it. So what you see here in this passage, some of the gospel themes that Paul highlights, I I think are vital in keeping us centered and grounded in this work. One of the ways that we're not going to fall captive to these worldly philosophies and false teachings, one of the ways that we're going to continue to walk in Christ, being rooted and built up and grounded in the faith, is by continuing to go back time and time again and be reminded of what Christ has done. I want you to see at least four ways the work of Christ, as Paul describes it here in this passage, impacts our lives, which in turn should fuel thankful hearts. This is the fuel, not because I'm telling you to be thankful. I just want to point you here to this passage and show you what generates true gratitude and thanksgiving. Four things, at least here, and just in this passage alone. Number one, we can, we can see the truth that we are filled in Christ. Look at verse 8 again. He says, see to it, no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Now, this is pretty massive. There's a lot that Paul says in those three verses. Look at verse 8 again. He says, don't be taken captive. And then he gives kind of the response to that. He says, don't be taken captive by these worldly teachings and not according to Christ. And then he goes further and begins unpacking the the beauty and glory of who Jesus is. And he says in verse 9, for in him, in Christ, look at what he says, the whole 
fullness of deity. Like the godness of God dwells in full in him. Notice the contrast. Don't be taken captive by that which is empty, but rather be grounded in that which is full, right? The fullness of God dwells in Christ. So look to him and don't look to these empty things of the world. It's a, it's a contrast that he's making. He's, he's encouraging the, the Christians to be filled in Christ, to, to, to look to the fullness that is theirs through Christ. You can follow Paul's logic here. Since the fullness of God is found in Christ, believers should not be deceived by empty philosophies. One of the greatest blessings of knowing and walking with Christ is that He gives us everything we need. And what Paul unpacks here is that that glorious reminder. He, he's, he's showing why Jesus is better, not just because He's true and because of the, the truth claims of who He is, but He's showing us why. He's, he's showing us it's because He is God in the flesh. He's fully divine. God has come down to us, and He's given us all that we need in Christ. One of the great blessings of, again, knowing that is, is knowing that Jesus gives us all that we need, and what Paul unpacks here is that reminder. You know, when you think about worship, I, I may have said this either last week or the week before, worship is, is we could describe it as warfare in a way, spiritually speaking, because when we're worshiping the Lord, we are making truth claims through our singing and preaching and, and hearing God's Word read and, and prayers prayed. We are declaring our allegiance to this God over all others. We are saying that the fullness of this God dwells bodily in Christ, who in turn fills our lives with His provision and His presence and His power. Paul is using this play on words here to highlight a very amazing reality. And so if you're a Christian, you have been made complete by being filled with the one in whom the fullness of God dwells. That's pretty amazing. It's a spectacular reality that in Christ we have the fullness of God and then to be filled by Him and in Him is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But not only do we see this this reference of being filled with, in Christ, we, we also have a reference to the union that's ours in Christ. Look at verse 11. So, in Him, that's a key phrase, in Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. So Paul here, Paul's a master, by the way, of using metaphors, metaphors and imagery to drive home certain truths. And here he says that believers, that Christians, are both circumcised and baptized. Now, we know that the physical act of circumcision in the Old Covenant was an identity marker for the people of God, and baptism is the same in the New Covenant. It's an identification marker for the, the people of God. But here, Paul's picking up on these these covenantal markers, if you will, as images, as metaphors, speaking to a spiritual reality. He he says there, he says, he, he refers to this circumcision. He says, in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So it's very clear he's not referring to the physical act of circumcision, right? He's referring to something else. And he goes on, he says, a circumcision without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, without getting into a whole lot of depth here, simply put, this circumcision made without hands is not physical circumcision, but the reference here to this this need for a cleansed heart. And you see that referenced in both the Old and New Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, we read there, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so you may love him with all your heart and soul and live. 
Paul refers to this circumcision of the heart in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, where he talks about how circumcision is not outward, but it is inward. It is this, this spiritual reality that we have in Christ. But this comes about, we're told here, by Christ's circumcision, which is a reference, it's a, it's a, it's a way to refer to the death of Christ. While physical circumcision requires the cutting off of flesh, the sacrifice of Christ involved his entire body. And so Paul's picking up on that language and he's applying it in a spiritual way to refer to the work of Jesus. He says also, having been buried with him in baptism, pointing us again to this idea, this picture of being dead and being raised with Christ. This is why baptism by immersion, when we practice baptism, is such a beautiful, symbolic picture of the work that Jesus has done in our lives. But here he's using that, that reference there to talk about the spiritual reality that we encounter in Christ. He's using these physical acts to describe spiritual realities that have taken place in the heart of the believer. He's describing here what scholars call our union with Christ, the fact that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Scripture speaks about this in so many different ways, how we are created in Christ. We are buried in Him. We are baptized into His death. We are united with Him in His resurrection. We are seated with Him in the heavenly places. These images then of circumcision and baptism point us to that union where we say, we we see that in verse 11, in him you were these things. And so we see this, this reference here, this union of Christ, which then brings us all the saving benefits that Jesus brings, which is again something we need to think about often, this union with Christ. We need to sing of it. We need to point to it. We need to be grounded in it. We need to to celebrate it, and so forth. Not only do we see our union with Christ, we see that we are made alive in Christ in verses 13 and 14. In verse 13, Paul highlights our condition outside of Christ. We are spiritually dead, and you who were dead, in what? your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Again, they're using that uncircumcision describing our spiritual condition, that we are dead in trespasses and sins, that we are separated from, from God because of sin. But then he quickly moves to the work of Christ, doesn't he? Look at verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive. You didn't make yourself alive. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So those who are spiritually dead, he's he's speaking here to to the church, to Christians. He said, you were once dead in trespasses and sin. Like spiritually speaking, you did not, you could not live on your own. There's nothing you could do to, to, to be alive spiritually. So God made you alive raising you. He does that having forgiven all of our trespasses. And in other words, God reverses the state that we are in as sinners by providing for us a spiritual resurrection into a new life, which is directly tied to the death and resurrection of Jesus. We are utterly helpless and unable to merit salvation on our own standing. Friends, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you need to hear that loud and clear. If you're not a Christian, there's nothing you can do to make yourself a Christian. Nothing. You you can pray all you want. You can read the Bible all you want. You can be nice all you want. You can do all kinds of generous things and give all kinds of money to all these wonderful organizations. There's nothing you can do to earn favor with God on your own because you are spiritually dead. And God must make you alive by His grace. We are helpless and unable to merit salvation on our own standing. That is crystal clear in this passage and so many others. And yet God comes and makes us alive and applies the, the benefits of His Son through His life, death, and resurrection as we look to Him and trust in Him. 
It's in this reality that we want to celebrate often in our worship as we are reminded time and time again of our redemption and our salvation, a salvation that we were freely given, a salvation that God applied to us by regenerating us and making us alive and enabling us to see the beauty and glories and wonders of Christ that we might trust in Him and not in ourselves. Think about that when we sing certain songs that reference like super clearly, the cross and the resurrection. There's a reason. There's a reason we get a bit charged up when we start to sing through that sequence of the gospel, isn't it? Like when we start to sing about how Jesus paid it all and how he died in our place and how he, he, he redeemed us and forgave us, we start singing about that and then we're reminded that not only did he die, he was raised from the dead and pointing us to that victory that's ours in Christ, there's a reason we get more charged up in those moments, right? Today's song, for example, Jesus Paid It All, I think is a great example. Just the lyrics of that hymn, and I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Find in Christ all that you need. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Only only God can save. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. And then that little tag, sometimes we don't like those little tags on old hymns, do we? This is a good one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debts and raised this life up from the dead. Like, that's what we want to do. We're literally making, we're selecting that song to put words in your mouth so that you can express your praise and gratitude to God because He's done this for you, sinner. He has saved you. He has redeemed you. He has forgiven you. He has pardoned you. You come in here and you praise him and then you're reminded of just your ugliness and your dirtiness and, and the brokenness of, of what sin does. And then we're, re, re, we're refocused very quickly back to the beauty and wonder and glory of Christ and we sing a song like that. And yes, we want to celebrate. Yes, you should be like, this is great. That's why we call it good news. That's why we should be thankful. What Paul says in verse 13, the second part, God made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Just think about for a moment the current financial debt you may have. You have zero debt, congratulations. But think about, for the vast majority of the people in this room, it's likely that you have some level of debt. Some of you are frustrated that I've even brought it up because it bugs you, right? Car debt, credit cards, student loans, mortgage, likely some debt that you haven't. So imagine just the debt you have. Imagine if you left here today and someone stood at the door and handed you a slip of paper that said, Oh, by the way, all of your financial debt has been paid in full. Now, my guess is you wouldn't go out to your car shrugging your shoulders and say, well, that's nice. Let's go buy a nice lunch and put it on the credit card. You're not going to do that. No, you would leave here overwhelmed with gratitude. You would be ecstatic. Like, no more debt? Is that for real? That that would be kind of the response. Like you'd probably argue with the person for a minute. Wait a minute, how is that even possible? Well, friends, our problem before God is that we have incurred a debt we can never pay off. Like Dave Ramsey's baby steps won't cut it with that one. Because of sin, we are condemned and dead in sin. And the law has sealed the case against us. That's our story. 
But when Christ died, when Jesus hung on the cross, he took that record of debts that stood against us, and it was nailed to his cross, your debt and mine. And he paid the penalty in full. Like he took your debt to his cross and said, it is finished, paid in full. Like, listen, that's what he does. That's what salvation is. That's what he has provided for us. God does not just erase our debts. That's not how it works. No, he pays it off as he sends his son into the world to live a life of righteousness and holiness, and yet he dies on a cross. He's dying there to pay off your debt, the judgment that you deserve and I deserve. He dies on a cross, and he pays the penalty himself in full so that you can be redeemed in full, so that you can stand there, as the hymn says one day, singing, standing in him complete, celebrating for eternity all that he's given you through his son. Friends, we need regular reminders of that. Every week we gather, we want to be pointed to that because my guess is, just like I don't know if you're like me, you might not think about that every single second of every single day. And you get caught up in the things of this world and you come back into this room and you're reminded, you're, you're reoriented about the, the, the work and beauty of what Christ has done and then our hearts are humbled and we grow thankful. Not only do we see how we're made alive in Christ, we, are, we see also in verse 15 how we're secure in Christ. Back in verse 8, Paul urges the Colossians not to be taken captive by teachings that were humanly conceived and demonically encouraged. And he now gives the reason why it's not only needed, but why that can happen. Namely, because Christ has disarmed the rulers and authorities, these demonic forces at work. Look at verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He gives the reason why there's no need to be taken captive by these empty deceivers, these demonic teachings. This word triumph here, you see that there in verse 15. In ancient times, it was common that a victorious army would lead its defeated enemies in a parade to openly shame them before the people. And what we're being told here, Paul is saying that Jesus has done that at the cross. He's done that at the cross, for it was at the cross that our salvation was accomplished, and the empty tomb points to the fact that our victor is alive today. The cross and the empty tomb is is triumphant. It's publicly shaming the enemy, saying, you're a loser. Christ is the victor, and in him we are secure. And that is good news. And that means that while there's this concerted effort by these rulers and authorities to deceive hearts of believers and to divert our our attention away from Christ to, to false things, they are actually, listen, they are powerless to do so. You know, Satan and his demons love to accuse us. They love to tempt. They love to try and persuade us. But in the end, they cannot overcome us because Christ has defeated them. Cling to that truth, Christian. Satan may bruise you. He may discourage you. He may even harm you. But he can never, ever, ever destroy you. Does that not make you thankful? Not, like just hearing that, isn't that like, <laughs> praise God. That's good news. I need to hear that more often. I need to sing about that more often. I need to hear prayers prayed that keep that kind of thing in mind more often. That's what we're trying to do in our basic gospel-shaped liturgy week after week. Secure in Christ. The reason I wanted to spend most of my time this morning on that fuel is because I just wanted to let that text and those truths just just resonate in your hearts so that you can experience that fuel firsthand. 
I'm not telling you, I'm not standing here saying be thankful. I'm showing you why you should be. And that's what we want to do each and every week. Which leads me to point number three, the response of thankfulness. There are many ways we can express gratitude. Two main ways mentioned here in this, these chapters. Look at verse 7, back in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 again. He says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Walk in him, how? Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. One of the ways that you can be thankful is to obey Jesus. To walk in him. To live a life rooted and built up in him. To be walking with him every single day. One of the basic ways you can be thankful as a Christian is to open your Bible every day. One of the most ways that you can be ungrateful is to close your Bibles every day. Like, just walk with Jesus. Like, if you're truly thankful for all that he's given you and all that he's done for you, then spend time with him and walk with him and follow him and obey him, listen to him, commune with him. And if you're not doing those things, you're just not thankful. It's revealed in our walk. Walking in Christ is actually one of the most simple ways for you to demonstrate gratitude. You don't have to write Jesus a thank you card. Just walk with him. Walk with him. How you and I live in relationship to Christ will portray the level of gratitude that is present in our hearts. But not only is it revealed in our walk, it should be regular in our worship, and that's what we're talking about here in this series It's interesting that Paul even says in chapter 3 that we should let the word of Christ dwell in us richly so that we teach and admonish each other. How? By singing to and with each other. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So that's what we want to try to cultivate in a liturgy that aspect of gratitude and thanksgiving. This gospel reflex that shows up in our singing. So we want to sing songs that cultivate and express that kind of gratitude. So at least one song each week during that time of of thanksgiving, we want it to orient us towards that reflex. We want the songs that we sing to, to, to either call us to thanksgiving or to enable us to put the words literally in our mouth to express that thanksgiving. But it's not just in our singing. We also have a time, what we call a prayer of intercession, where we're allowing the gratefulness that we have to God to move in us in a way where we cry out to Him for His aid and His care. Like he's done all that was needed to secure a right standing with him. And so when we intercede, when we pray to the Lord, we are showing and we are saying to God, we need you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for supplying all that I need. I need you more. I need you more and more every single day. I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your healing. I need your guidance. I need your grace. So interceding, when we're praying for ourselves and our community and our nation and the world, it's with that that posture of thanksgiving that is present in our lives. When we are grateful to the Lord, we naturally desire more of His grace in our lives. It's also present in our giving. Grateful hearts are also generous hearts. Listen, God doesn't need your money. He doesn't. Like he owns it all. But as we give of tithes and offerings each and every week, we're giving out of the overflow of our hearts. We're giving out of a sense of gratitude for what God has done for us and in us, what he's done in this church. And, and as we give, we are giving to invest in the work of God's kingdom here and throughout the world as a, as a way to just honor him and just say, Lord, here is a return of what you've already blessed me with. Let me express my gratitude even as I give. And so these aspects of singing, of praying, of giving 
are present in a worship service to allow those expressions of gratitude to be cultivated and to be expressed in these ways. Like it's on purpose. I don't know why I waited till like I was in my late 30s to figure that out. Like I just thought you showed up to church and we sang and we did this. It was just what you're supposed to do, right? That's what you're supposed to do. I grew up in Mountains of East Tennessee, where they'd even say, all right, let's sing the first, third, and fourth verse. They'd always skip a verse. That irritated me. There was no, there was no deliberateness in that. Sweet people. But a little bit too unstructured. Structure's good if it points us in the right direction. If it grounds us in the right truth. If it secures us with the right attitude and the right hope. So friends, this part of our liturgy is here to orient our hearts towards gratitude. It's there to prompt it. It's there to fuel it. And yes, it's even there to help us express it as we sing, as we pray, as we give. Liturgy is important because it provides that structure for what we need. What we need. We need to see and behold a gloriously big and sovereign God, don't we? We need to see that. Otherwise, you can stay glued to the news last night and today and just be extremely discouraged and grow towards despair. We need to come into a room like this, no matter what's going on in the world, and be reminded that there is a king who rules over all, and he can be fully trusted. Nothing takes him by surprise, and nothing is outside of his control. We need to be reminded of that. We need to celebrate that. We need to affirm that. We need to rejoice in that every single week. We need to come and be reminded and and certainly aware of the reality of who we are as sinners and be be able to have space to, to acknowledge our shortcomings to God and yet be assured that we are still right before Him because of Christ. That is a wonderful reality that just then fuels that thanksgiving so that we can rejoice and give God the thanks that is due His name. It's that assurance and hope that generates thankfulness in our hearts. And that thankfulness in our hearts is seen and demonstrated as we express joy in our songs, boldness in our praying, and generosity in our giving. When is the last time you thought to the Lord or said to the Lord in prayer, thank you. Thank you for being so gracious and generous to me, a sinner. Thank you. And we want to give you that excuse every single week. May we thank the Lord for his goodness and his grace. We deserve none of it. And he has been generous to give all of it for his glory and our good. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that we can share together to be reminded, to be encouraged of all that you've done for us in Christ. Lord, were it not for Jesus, where would we be? We would be without hope. Lord, we would be miserable in our sin, but yet, God, you have done this glorious redemptive work to save us. And so, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for being generous. Thank you for being gracious. Lord, thank you for waking us up this morning in the midst of a very broken and evil world and reminding us of what is good. Even as the world goes to hell, Father, we have a king who reigns in heaven. We have a savior who gave himself in full for our sake. There's no greater news than that in the world. And we thank you that we can come here this morning and celebrate that fact and that hope that we share. We pray this in Jesus' name.